Hello everyone, I'm the Catholic Bible Geek. Welcome back to the channel. And today we're going to look at our third part of the study through the Gospel of John. If you remember, the first study was the prologue. Remember we said the Gospel of John is divided up into four parts. There's the prologue, the Book of Signs, the Book of uh, Glory, and then the epilogue, or the denouement there. So we finished up the prologue, and then we did the rest of the Book of John, chapter 1, which was the beginning of the Book of Signs. Now we're really moving into the book of signs, because that part was just John the Baptist and John the Baptist's testimony of Jesus. But now we're moving into his first miracle. And it, it's a big one. This is what actually is one of the mysteries, the luminous mysteries that we meditate and pray over during the rosaries, the wedding of Cana, the Jesus turning water into wine. So we're going to read today from chapter two, verses one through 12. So let's go ahead and get into it. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. When the wine ran short, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, how does your concern affect me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servers, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for Jewish ceremonial washings, each holding twenty to thirty gallons. Jesus told them, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Draw out some now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it, and when the head waiter tasted the water that had become wine, without knowing where it came from, although the servers who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, an inferior wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this as the beginning of his signs in Cana, in Galilee, and so revealed his glory, and his disciples began to believe in him. After this, he and his mother his brothers, and his disciples, went down to Capernaum and stayed there only a few days. So we've got a lot going on here. Let's start with the idea of this wedding, first of all. Tradition says that this was actually the Apostle Jude's wedding. We don't know that for certain, but tradition says it, and there are some indicators that possibly that's the case. For example, Jesus and his disciples are all invited, as is Mary. Jude was a cousin of Jesus's. And in fact, when this passage talks about Jesus's brothers, or brethren is a probably a better uh, translation of the word in Greek there, that this was a word termed to mean cousins, aunts, uncles, everybody. Your family was your brethren. It was a, a general term. People like to, you know, Protestants like to look at that and say, see, Mary wasn't a virgin. How could she be a virgin if you had brothers and sisters? Well, it's that idea of brethren again. Weddings were also big deal in the, in the Jewish custom of the days, still are actually. They wouldn't even drink wine really much until they were at a wedding, honestly. And it was a big deal. It, it was a, there would have been a social stigma on the person who had failed to prepare enough wine for the wedding. So this was a big deal. This was a real favor Jesus was doing, not just because his mother asked him, but to the, to the groom, to the wedding party there. So let's dive now into this interaction between Mary and Jesus, because this confuses some people. First of all, before we even get to the words spoken, it's interesting to point out that Mary knows that Jesus can help. We don't get a lot of information about Jesus' childhood. We have the, the one scene when he was lost uh, in, in the temple, or found in the temple in Jerusalem there. But that's really it. So this is an indicator that, that Jesus' childhood is. I mean, Mary's been storing these things up and pondering them in her heart, as the Gospels tell us, you know, from uh, you know when he was an infant, and she would hear all these prophecies and whatnot. But... She knows this. She knows that he has the power to help. So that's interesting. When she goes to him, she tells him of the need that's there. She, uh, when the wine ran short, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. This is Mary interceding for the wedding party there. She's interceding for the, the wedding and the guests and everyone there. She's coming to Jesus and telling him, there's a problem here. They have no wine. This is her role in heaven even now, interceding for us. Not working magical things because of her own power, no, but interceding for us because of her special place as the mother of Jesus. This story also really illustrates the idea of Christ is the new Adam and Mary is the new Eve. And if you missed those videos, I'll place a link in the top right hand corner along with the playlist for these videos for the Gospel of John. But I really went into some in depth in there talking about how this scene in particular is a, is a culmination, it is the beginning of this redemption of the Garden of Eden's fall, and how Christ as the new Adam and Mary as the new Eve work this out. But we see this already. Remember that Eve 
Eve, the woman, the first, you know, and Adam says, the woman you gave me, you know, told me to do this and such. That's why Jesus calls her here woman. One thing, it's not as uh, harsh as it sounds to the English language. This Greek word woman was actually a title. It would have been like, uh, I don't know what the good translation is, depending on your culture, miss, madam, lady, or something like that. It was a high, it was better than that. It was a higher, uh, higher mark of respect to call a woman. So woman, he says, how does your concern affect me? My hour has not come yet. Jesus is not reluctant here to help people. He's not, he's not wanting to wait this out and, and not do anything until it's time to be sacrificed. No, what he's doing here is he's allowing this scene to play out as a redemption of the Garden of Eden. Eve went and told Adam, look at this fruit. You should eat of it. You should do the thing God tells us not to do. Mary is the new Eve is telling Christ, the new Adam, it's time to begin the thing God sent you to do. Whereas Eve encouraged disobedience, Mary is encouraging obedience. Jesus is allowing this scene to play out. And she even does that to those around. She even tells everyone else, do whatever he tells you to. This is the message of Mary. When people talk about a consecration to Mary or, or having a great devotion to Mary, it has nothing to do with Mary as this wonderful divine power. We respect her, we venerate her as the mother of Christ, but she's a created being, as I've said many times before. It's her role as the mother of Christ. It's Christ in her. It's the Holy Spirit in her that we are that we are so enamored with. And, and her role there in, in interceding for us to Christ and helping us helping us to do whatever he tells us to do. That's Mary's role. That's what she's there for. So she says, do whatever he tells you to. And then he said, and then the text tells us there were six stone jars, and these were for Jewish ceremonial washings. So we'll learn as we go through the Gospels that the Pharisees in particular, they added a lot of little rules on to the Levitical laws. The Levitical laws of the Old Testament, uh, you know, eat nothing impure, and there were washings and stuff like that, but the Pharisees added a lot of different things, and basic washing before a feast, this is a basic, basic, uh, useful tradition even. So these jars are used there as ceremonial washings. I think it's interesting, and this is one of the things that I usually meditate over when I'm thinking about the, uh, the wedding at Cana here. This is a useful thing to do. It makes sense to us in, in current day to wash before you eat. But this ceremonial washing, you can imagine that it's a bit of a uh, a bit of a chore, maybe even a bit of a burden, exactly how it was done and stuff like that. We know that Jesus later on in the Gospels will certainly tell the Pharisees that uh, that they don't need such things. They don't need such additions to the law of God. But you think of your average Jew here going to a wedding in these days and and observing these customs, observing the ceremonial washings from a place of obedience, from wanting to be obedient to God in the law and to make sure that no unclean thing passes his lips and so forth. This is an um, act of obedience, uh, however tedious it might be, whatever, however much of a burden it might be just to do these ceremonial washings each time before you're there to let loose and, and you enjoy yourself at a wedding. Um, Jesus takes that, that maybe possibly tedious little thing that you do out of obedience and transforms it into something glorious. He takes the water, not just water, water, but water for washings, and transforms it into wine for drinking. That's a big deal. That's a wonderful picture of how Christ will take all of the little things we do. Maybe it's a it's a chore to to uh, maybe you, you've committed to saying the rosary every day or something like that. Or um, I mean, nothing should be a chore. We should always have our heart in the right place. But we're human. Sometimes the little things we do in obedience to God can seem. Maybe we're hearts just not in it at the right point, but we do it anyway. We do it out of obedience, and that's good. And we hope to, to get our heart and mind in the right place where it's not a, a, a burden for us. God loves a cheerful giver in, in all things, of course. But this is an encouraging picture that these little things that maybe we don't even understand, maybe some of the church teachings, you don't quite get. You don't quite understand, but you just say, you know what? I believe in the church, though. I believe in its authority that Christ gave it, so I'm going to follow its teachings, even though I don't quite understand it completely, but I'm going to follow it because I know that this is the church and the authority that Christ set up. So in being obedient to these rules, I'm being obedient to Christ. Christ honors that. Christ blesses that. And he's going to transform that from something that we might not understand, some sort of obedience that might be somewhat of a burden to us in any way. He's going to transform that into something glorious if we continue to do it with the right heart, which is to to give that obedience to God. That's a great picture because there are a lot of times, I mean, especially as a, as a new Catholic, when I'm learning 
uh, when I would learn new customs of the church, not customs, but learn new teachings, new doctrines of the church and uh, things. I mean, a lot of Catholics don't even know, for example, you know, back in the day, uh, you couldn't eat meat on Fridays. That was, a, a you know, one of the laws of the Catholic Church there. Well, that's been pulled back. And a lot of people think, well, great, well, you don't do anything. Now. No, Friday, you still have to make a penance of some type. Uh, it doesn't have to be abstaining from meat, but it could be. Uh, but if it's not, something else, you know, uh, praying an extra rosary or a rosary or something like that, any kind of penance, Friday is a penitent day every Friday, not just the Fridays in Lent. So that's, uh, that's something a lot of Catholics don't even realize. And when you first realize it, when I first realized that, it wasn't so much of a burden, but it was, it was, all right, I got to figure out what exactly am I doing, uh, you know, this and that for and stuff. So, you know, you learn these things, uh, whether you've been a Catholic all your life and maybe just haven't, uh, haven't been properly catechized or if, uh, if you're a convert or whatever. But these, uh, these rules, these marks of obedience, Christ does transform them. So it transforms them gloriously, of course, because the wine doesn't just, it isn't just changed into wine. The water is changed into the best wine. I mean, this is clearly, they say this is better than any of the wine they've had at the wedding thus far. You saved the best for last and so forth. And then this was it. This was the first sign. So this is the beginning of Jesus's ministry. As I said, Mary is, is calling Jesus into doing what God, uh, God asked him, asked of him and God sent him here to do, which is to have this ministry of signs, have this ministry of miracles, and then to, uh, preach the kingdom while he's doing it. And ultimately, you know, the sacrifice. So it's a beautiful picture. I don't want to go too much farther into that because I want to leave leave uh, space for your own meditations. But it's something that I would I would encourage you to read through yourself, even after we talked about it here. Go back and read through it, see what things the Holy Spirit brings to your mind in terms of uh, maybe perhaps rules or whatever things that are difficult to follow, or just meditating on this idea of of Christ as the new Adam and Mary as the new Eve, and how can how can you look to Mary personally to to help you be obedient to Christ and to to honor and glorify Him. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful resource we have as Catholics. So that's uh, another interesting point. That's where I'll stop today. We'll cover the second part of chapter two in the next part and maybe go into a little bit of three. We're going to take our time going through John, even if it takes us forever or whatever, but I want to make sure that we're going through and pulling out the, uh, the, the, the hints and interests in each section and, uh, providing things for you to meditate on as well. And, and we'll go through it as we go through it. We'll finish when we finish. So that's all for now. I will be back for some more uh, live streams and uh, videos to come, some more lists and everything like that. That seemed pretty popular. And of course, we have the Hobbit book study continuing on Monday nights as well. But that's all for now. Until then, keep enjoying and digging deeper into scripture. Thanks for watching.